targeted proteomics is uh, one approach to, to proteomic measurements and it's an approach that started to gain momentum back in 2006-2007 and is currently increasingly used, I would say, worldwide. So what you do in a targeted proteomic experiment is to focus on the measurement of specific proteins, proteins you are interested in. And you do that by focusing the mass spectrometer on the measurement of specific peptides from those proteins and specific fragments from those peptides. And this increases the, the selectivity and specificity. Now, this approach has two features that are very, very relevant for, for clinical applications. And, and these are sensitivity in detecting specific proteins in a very complex mixture and, and uh, also uh, pretty good throughput and reproducibility across samples. So now if the question is whether targeted proteomics has made it already to, to the clinics, well in fact SRM assays are already used in, in clinical applications but to measure small molecules. Now when it comes to, to proteins, there are additional challenges and the first challenge is uh, the dynamic range of protein expression, which covers several orders of magnitude in biological fluids and also in tissues. And this somehow precludes identification of low abundance proteins, which very often are very interesting targets for, for biomarker. Uh, as, as biomarkers, as potential biomarkers. The second problem is that to implement the targeted proteomics in a clinical setting, you need a sophisticated instrumentation, mass spectrometers, and you also need a highly trained personnel, so people that can run these instruments, and that can also deal with the instability issues, for example, of the nanochromatographic system coupled to the mass spectrometer. And the third problem is that SRM assays don't have yet uh, the same throughput of ELISA assays. So I would say these are the limitations. But on a positive note, I think as a, as a community, we have already succeeded in uh, demonstrating that targeted proteomics has very important features that are crucial for clinical applications. And these are low coefficient of variation. And also, um, inter, the interlaboratory variability is very low. So this is very important. And in fact, uh, there are some hospitals that run targeted proteomic assays to measure specific proteins, proteins for which uh, there is not a, no good ad antibody or the available antibodies have no, no sufficient, insufficient specificity. One good example is probably thyroglobulin, which is measured to detect uh, thyroid cancer. This is measured in certain hospitals already by SRM assays. And another area where I think um, SRM assays shine is in the biomarker verification stage. So the pipeline to discover biomarkers includes usually a discovery phase where you study a small number of individuals, patients versus healthy controls, and, and uh, you use uh, uh, unbiased approaches. Could be proteomics, could be transcriptomics. And this discovery phase results in a number of analytes in the range of 50 to 100 that could be potential biomarkers. But these are not yet safe because you need to, to, uh, to validate the, the efficacy of these biomarkers on a larger cohort of patients. And usually 50 to 100 analytes are too many for, for ELISA assay, so they exceed the multiplexing capacity of antibodies, but they are good for, for SRM. And so that's where I think the power of SRM uh, can, can be exploited in this very, in bridging between the discovery and the validation stages. And now with the, with the advent of uh, data independent approaches or, or SWOS, maybe one could even consider merging the discovery and verification phases because then you can exploit uh, the, the reproducibility and precision of targeted proteomics while reintroducing the unbiased analysis. So I've been interested in uh, in a property of proteins, uh, of certain proteins, uh, and this is the, the capability to stick to molecules of the same type and to form a very rigid and resistant material, which is resistant to pretty much uh, anything you can think of, detergents, uh, uh, um, proteases, and it's also an insoluble material, so when it is formed in a cell, it precipitates uh, and it is phase separated, and this is called amyloid material. And I've been interested in this pretty much since I was a, a PhD student. So an interesting aspect is that amyloid has been connected to toxicity for very long time, so it has been considered 
consider the pathological uh, material because it is found in the tissue of patients with uh, several diseases. For example, in the brain of patients with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, you find amyloid uh, deposits. They look like rocks in cells and, and in between cells as well. But now what is interesting is that in the last uh, 10 years, uh, the view has been slowly changing and, uh, and uh, several studies reported that amyloid can also be beneficial. So it, uh, a cell can use uh, an amyloid conversion as a re regulatory principle. So for example, if a cell doesn't need a protein anymore, instead of sending it for degradation, it can decide to turn it into an amyloid. And this will become insoluble and be subtracted from the cellular milieu. And so now every, every year, if you look into the literature, a handful of new proteins that have these properties, so they can, be, uh, they can behave as a regulatory amyloid, a handful of these is discovered every year. So it could very well be that this is a new layer of regulatory events in, in a cell. Now, uh, a one million dollar question is uh, what to differentiate the toxic amyloid and, and beneficial amyloid. Now, the field is really puzzled about this, and we, we don't really know. It cannot be structure because the structure of amyloid is very conserved, independent of the protein you, you, you look at. It's even recognized by the same antibodies, toxic and, and, uh, and beneficial amyloid. It could well be that uh, toxic, so amyloid is not really toxic, but it's a byproduct of some other toxic event. So to answer your question, if I had a, a, a magic wand to address a biochemical riddle, I would probably go for this, because if learning something about uh, the differentiation between these two states would also tell something about the molecular basis of diseases that are currently not curable. So proteomics has, has come a long way. I would say that we are now very close to where we wanted to be uh, at the beginning when the field was born back in the 90s. So at that time the aim of proteomics was defined as uh, uh, the capability to um, detect altered biological processes by measuring as many proteins as possible, ideally all the proteins in a cell or in an organism. And uh, now I would say that we are very close to, to that goal because we can already cover or measure several thousand proteins in a sample and several thousand proteins correspond to almost complete proteomes for several species. We have also uh, obtained the draft maps of the human proteome by measuring different samples and different tissues. We can also measure specific proteins we are interested in in, in a complex sample by targeted proteomics and we can capture post-translational modifications of various type and protein-protein interactions. So I would say uh, it has been really a very fast development. But there is actually one uh, type of event at the protein level that we are not really good at capturing. So I think this is a, a challenge for the future and this is protein structural changes. Structural changes of proteins are also very important in regulating the physiology of cells. If you, if you think about receptors, for example, when they bind a small molecule, they undergo a structural change. And this event alone triggers a complete cascade of downstream events. There are also pathological structural changes, like the one we just mentioned, of, of protein aggregates, or, or binding of small molecules to enzymes induces structural changes that can completely inactivate an enzyme. So it'd be, it would be also extremely relevant to be able to couple these types of events on a global scale, like we do for, for the other events at the protein level. So, and uh, in the becoming able to do that would actually provide uh, uh, readouts on uh, functional events, a new type of readout. So I believe that this is a, a direction for the future. So when we started our work on uh, protein thermostability, we were interested in the very basic question of what makes uh, cells die of heat, so when the temperature is increased, and why other cells instead are able to survive even at very high temperatures. If you look around on our planet, you will see that life is possible at a very broad range of temperatures. For example, our cells and also E. coli cells are happy at 37 degrees, while some microorganisms can live at temperatures beyond 100 degrees. But if now you look at cells from one single species, you will see that they are not really resistant to large shifts in temperatures above or below the, the optimal living temperature. For example, E. coli already die at 45 degrees or so. 
So we asked the question, why do cells die when the temperature is increased and why do certain cells instead are able to survive? And we focused on proteins, because proteins are the least stable biomolecules. So for a long time people thought that the collapse of cells due to temperature was due to, to proteome collapse. But what was not clear is whether uh, the proteome collapsed all at once, so all proteins were denatured in, in a very narrow temperature range, or whether cell death was due to very specific proteins with key functions. And so we decided to address that and we developed a method to, to acquire protein unfolding profiles on a proteome-wide scale. And uh, this method is based on uh, limited proteolysis coupled with mass spectrometry. So what we do um, essentially is to use proteolytic accessibility as a readout for unfolding of a protein. So if we plot then proteolytic accessibility along uh, the, the temperature gradient, what we measure is, is an, uh, basically an unfolding curve. And from that we can extract several stability parameters from our protein. And to cut a long story short, we applied this approach to several proteomes, so to several, from several species, for example, human cells, uh, E. coli cells, uh, yeast cells. We also chose to focus on a thermostable bacterium. And then uh, from this data, we learned that actually uh, cell death due to an increase in temperature is due to the loss of very few, very essential proteins with key function. And that thermophilic bacteria achieve stabilization of, of, of the cell physiology by, by specifically stabilizing precisely those proteins that are lost in mesophilic bacteria and by reducing the propensity of their proteins to aggregate.